Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Christy Koenig, and I serve as the EMS Medical Director for the County of San Diego. Welcome to the next talk in our series of evidence-based medicine lectures as part of the uh, BSPC Committee. And today, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Michelle Safferman speaking on our supraglottic airways, all that super. <laughs> To we'll turn it over now to Dr. Dave Duncan, who is uh, from our team, but was previously the director of the EMS Authority for the entire state of California. Dave, if you would like to please introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Thank you, Dr. Safferman, for taking this on. Welcome. Good afternoon. In the interest of time, I'm going to try and be brief here. Uh, of note, superglottic airways have endured a, a tumultuous history in California, first disallowed by a, a director three before me, and then made their way into local optional scope of practice for California. Uh, the director before the current, i.e. me, reinterpreted the regs to include superglottic airways, uh, and now they, they exist in standard scope of practice for paramedics. So uh, with that, I'd like to just introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Michelle Safferman, thank her for taking this on, a complex issue. Uh, Michelle grew up in Baltimore, got her, got her bachelor's at U of Maryland, moved to New York City as an AmeriCorps member where she worked with a number of FQHCs, uh, transitioned up to medical school at Cooper Medical School in Camden, New Jersey, did her residency in emergency medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City, and she's currently completing her fellowship in EMS and disaster medicine at UCSD, uh, and in her very limited free time, I'm sure, uh, enjoys running, hiking, and baking. I was going to say biking. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, baking doesn't really go with so too, but uh, for another day. Right? <laughs> so Dr. Safferman, thank you for taking on this complex topic. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so, as was mentioned, the title of my presentation is Are Superglottic Airways All That Super? So, I'm by no means an expert on this topic, but I have had the opportunity to go through a lot of the literature, and, but that being said, would love to hear if anyone has any thoughts or comments at any point. Um, so, superglottic airways have gained a lot of popularity. Initially, this was in the anesthesia world, but more and more so, they're gaining popularity in the pre-hospital setting. So, Today, we're going to delve a bit more into the literature surrounding their use. Oops. So first, it's important to do a quick review of the anatomy of the larynx specifically. So you can see it from different angles here. Importantly, the big red arrow is pointing at the glottis. And this is the part of the larynx consisting of the vocal cords and then the space between them. So as the name sounds, the supraglottic space is the part of the larynx above the glottics, which you can see highlighted here in green. And then there's other spaces like subglottic and retroglottic, which we'll see on the next slide. So if we zoom out a bit from supraglottic airway devices, we have the overarching term of extraglottic airway devices. And there's a lot of different ways to classify these devices. This is, in my opinion, the simplest one. It's based on the location of the device within the airway. And it's broken down from extraglottic airways into supraglottic and retroglottic. So supraglottic devices are the laryngeal masks that seal around the glottic opening and they remain superior to the larynx. And then retroglottic devices, which you can see kind of where that space is, a lot of the images of the larynx don't include it, but I added it here. It's uh, obviously retro, so behind the glottis. And these are usually tu tubes that terminate in the upper esophagus posterior to the glottis. So this is another way of classifying them. It's a little bit more complicated, but it is used in a lot of the literature out there. And this is the Cook classification, and this is by generation. So the first generation of supraglottic devices essentially had only a single breathing channel with some kind of mask that sits around the larynx. So you can see some of the more common ones here, the top left being the LMA Classic, which was the basic reusable first device. And then they came out with the LMA Unique, which is next to it. And then below that was the Sure Seal, which is when we were kind of getting a little bit more advanced. This one can monitor pressure in the cuff. And then we have the second generation devices there, which you can see some of the more common ones in the middle. These incorporate some sort of method of providing gastric drainage to prevent against aspiration. And then they also can have additional features like bite blocks and those cuff pressure monitors. So here you can see in the upper left in the middle, that's the LMA Pro Seal and then the Air QSP which has a self-inflating low pressure cuff 
And in the bottom of that middle section is the eye gel, which we're going to be talking a lot more about today. And then there's this third generation, which is not really well accepted yet, but it's been proposed and has some kind of mechanism for dynamic sealing that changes with ventilation. And there are some models out there working on this. So if we think of airway interventions on a spectrum of least to most invasive, least being bag mass ventilation and most being endotracheal intubation, extraglottic devices fall somewhere in between. And there's a lot of different terminology that's thrown out in the conversation surrounding these devices. A lot of times they're used interchangeably, but it's not always the appropriate word that's being used. So things that you'll hear in addition to the superglottic and extraglottic are laryngeal tubes, which are usually referring to retroglottic devices. You'll hear perilaryngeal airway adjunct, laryngeal mask airways, LMA. Oftentimes the word LMA will just be used to refer to superglottic devices, but this is actually a specific brand of one of the early devices that's just become very commonly used, but not necessarily the, the perfect word. So just a fun, quick history slide. This is Dr. Archie Brain. Um, he is the inventor of the first LMA. He's a British anesthesiologist. You can see on the right there some of his early sketches of the first LMA, which came to the market in the UK around 1987. So what makes an ideal extraglottic airway device? So first off, it should be easy to place. And a really important step for that is removing the step of inflation that greatly uh, increases the ease of placement. It should also provide effective oxygenation and ventilation. And lastly, it should allow for gastric decompression and ideally tracheal intubation through it, but this is less important for our purposes in the pre-hospital setting, but should be mentioned if we're talking about an ideal device. So I included this slide more for reference. This is a list of some of the more common extraglottic devices that are in use now, and it outlines their location within the glottis. You can see most are superglottic. There's a couple that we'll talk about that are retroglottic, and then the ability to pass an OG tube through them, and that kind of distinguishes the first from the second generations. And then lastly, again, not as relevant to us, but the ability to blindly intubate through them. So this is the San Diego County BLS equipment list. Uh, so you can see that we have BVMs of all different sizes in addition to OPAs, um, ranging from premature all the way up to adults. And then as far as the equipment lift list for San Diego County for ALS, we have adult sized endotracheal tubes. We have available small adult combi tubes and King Airways, which most of the county I believe is using the King Airways. It seems the combi tubes have gone a little bit uh, more so out of favor. But just to touch on kind of what the difference is between the combi tube and the King Airway. So this is the combi tube. It's a dual lumen, dual cuff, retroglottic airway, and it's designed to be placed, as we said, with retroglottics in the proximal esophagus. And one cuff, as you can see, lies above the glottis, and the other is retroglottic in the uh, tip of the esophagus. Uh, so this allows for direct ventilation through the cuff into the trachea. Um, you can't place an endotracheal through, tube through a combi tube. Um, and then the challenge with a lot of these devices is the, inflate, the inflatable uh, aspect of them increases the risk of soft tissue trauma to the pharynx when, when these are being placed. So it's a, just an important consideration. And then here is the king laryngeal tube. So oftentimes people will say laryngeal tube, they're referring to the king. There are some others though. Um, and like the combi tube, the king has a pharyngeal cuff and an esophageal cuff that you can see there. It has a single inflation valve that fills up both of the cuffs and it has a single large lumen instead of the two smaller ones on the combi tube. And then there's a port between the cuffs that allows for gas exchange. Um, it's shorter than the combi tube and it's pretty much across the board easier to place and troubleshoot than the combi tube. Um, it is possible to intubate through the newer King Airways, but it's still difficult. So I just wanted to include this here. This is the state of California EMS regulations that were updated in July of 2021. So this is from chapter four, article two. It kind of talks about the scope of practice of a paramedic. And it states that um, in D, they can perform pulmonary ventilation by use of lower airway, multi-lumen adjuncts, the esophageal airway, perilaryngeal airways, stomal intubation, and adult oral endotracheal intubation. So as Dr. Duncan mentioned, this perilaryngeal airways was kind of left open to interpretation. And during his term, he did find um, some research, uh, more so in the anesthesia journals, that did include superglottic airways under this perilaryngeal airway definition. So now we're gonna move into our literature review. So the first question here is, is there a best, most ideal extraglottic airway device? 
And there is a fair amount of literature that dives into this topic. A lot of it is more so in the simulated environment, um, but we'll go, so, go through some of the studies now. So it's sometimes there's a lot of information if you want just the takeaway. I have it in red at the bottom. But this first study compared the IGEL to the King Airway in a simulated tactical environment. And they were trying to determine if one device is superior in minimizing the time to successful tube placement. It was a prospective randomized crossover uh, study with basic EMT level participants who were either randomized to perform tactical airway management um, with the King, and this was all done on a mannequin, or the uh, um, IGEL airway. And then again, they switched over and used the alternate device. And what they mean by tactical is that the participants had to first do a low military type crawl and then remain in this low position to actually uh, place the tube, which can be relevant to some times in the field for our providers. Um, so what they found was that time to successful placement for the King Airway was 39.7 seconds versus 14 seconds for the IGEL. And this was statistically significant. Significant. And if they asked the participant which device they actually preferred, 100% in this case preferred the IGEL over the King Airway. So this next study compared emergency airway management, again, in this simulated environment, they compared endotracheal intubation versus the standard LMA versus the IGEL. And they had 72 paramedics that were included in this study, and they were given a brief educational ses session, and then they were, they were randomly allocated to place the device in an adult mannequin. And what they found is that the success rates for the IGEL was higher than that for both the LMA and the endotracheal intubation. They also found that the insertion time was significantly shorter than both of the other devices. And then also they found that only for the LMA was there a statistically significant association between the experience level of the paramedic and the time to insertion. So again, another study um, using Matica models that assessed the speed and placement of three superglottic airway devices by paramedics. This time they had 36 medic students and they timed them on their insertion of the IGEL, standard LMA, and the laryngeal tracheal airway. And again, the IGEL was consistently the fastest airway device. You can see the difference in the times there. In some cases, uh, more than half uh, the time to place one of the other devices. And in this case, 63% preferred using the IGEL. And the reasons that they cited were ease of use, and they were happy that they were able to insert it really quickly. So again, another study this confer, uh, compared five different second generation devices. So the ones in the middle, including the IGEL um, on the picture we looked at before. And this was in a simulated field scenario and all devices were inserted by non-experienced military personnel. And the main finding was that the most suitable devices for use in these scenarios were the Supreme LMA and the IGEL. And then the reasons for this was high first pass success rate, faster insertion times, and then just in general, participants felt they were the easiest to insert. And of note, the King Airway and another superglottic, it's called the SLIPA, it's the streamlined liner of the pharynx airway, those ones were shown to have less favorable insertion parameter parameters. So again, kind of beating a dead horse uh, here, it's getting a bit redundant, but this same thing again, this looked at uh, different mannequin models. So if you're interested in, in kind of what the best mannequin model for training uh, for training with IGEL devices or different devices uh, on is which one is best, this study did cover that. But um, in, they also looked at eight different superglottics. And the general takeaway was that the IGEL was significantly the easiest and the shortest to insert. So the last study I included this, and I know it's starting to sound like a broken record, this was a meta-analysis, which as you know, provides the highest quality level of evidence. And these studies were done in patients undergoing elective surgeries, so not as relevant to us, but still um, some good takeaways from it. And they looked at 31 randomized controlled trials that specifically compared the IGEL versus the LMA. And it demonstrated that the IGEL, at least of relevance to us in the pre-hospital setting, had the shortest time to insertion. They also found that there was reduced but left, less relevant to us uh, post-operative sore throat and the rate of poor fiber optic view through the airway. Um, they did find that compared to all the LMA types, there was no evidence that the IGEL affected the leak pressure. So there's less concern for a poor seal or the rate of insertion on the first attempt. Um, and lastly, this systematic review, there was little power to detect a difference in the rates of insertion at first attempt, as most of the devices were able to be inserted on the first attempt in their study. So back to our question, should S SGA devices, specifically the IGEL, be adopted for San Diego County paramedic adult airway management? So in summary, the IGEL is consistently one of the fast, fastest ex extraglottic devices to insert, as you can see in nearly every study that I looked at. Um, and I there were more, but I stopped including them. 
because uh, I think we all got the point. Um, it also was the preferred device by pre-hospital providers for ease of insertion. So my recommendation based on this is that it's reasonable to add it to the list for San Diego County. So just a little bit more about the eye gel uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a second generation supraglottic device. Um, it's made from a thermoplastic elastomer. So it's PVC and latex free. And importantly, there's no inflating cuff, um, which as we talked about before, makes it a, a more ideal uh, device. It also has an integrated bite block and it has the gastric channel drain tube site. So this is just a quick video. Okay, so moving on to the next question, which was, is there evidence to recommend eye gels as the first choice for certain presentations or scenarios for paramedic airway management instead of endotracheal intubation? So based on my review of the literature, the obvious scenario that we would ask this question in would be out of hospital cardiac arrest. So that's what I focused on. So here you can see the attached San Diego County EMS protocol for both, both BLS and ALS for CPR. As far as airway management, we can see that for BLS, we have obviously bag mass ventilation um, and O2 saturation monitoring. And then for ALS, we have endotracheal tubes. We have perilaryngeal airway adjuncts, as we spoke about, either the King or the Combi tube. Um, and then there's also specific mention of waveform capnography, which is really important and we'll talk a little bit more about. So... The endotracheal tube has long been considered the gold standard for airway management during resuscitation. Um, just wanna say upfront that there's not really a consensus on the optimal airway device for pre-hospital clinicians during resuscitation, but there is a consensus that during CPR, interruptions to compressions for airway insertion should be no greater than 10 to 15 seconds. So there are a lot of older studies that looked at pre-hospital use of superglottic airway devices versus intubation in the setting of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. This is one of them. It was a nationwide population-based observational study. It was done in Japan, and they looked at neurologic outcomes with different airway management techniques in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They categorized patients into three different groups depending on the airway device used. So the first group was LMA, the second was intubation, and then the third was what they called esophageal obturator airways, which basically included the king and the combi tube. So for our uh, terminology, what we would call like the retroglottic devices. And their data showed significantly higher rates of one month survival in the intubation group. However, the neurologic outcomes were pretty poor across the board. So in the intubation group, for example, it was 1.1% versus 0.98 in the LMA group versus the uh, retroglottic devices was 1.04. So pretty low across the board, but it was statistically significant. But one of the pitfalls with this study and a lot of the studies from this time were that they were classified, so the patients were classified by the device that was in use when they arrived at the hospital. So for example, if they, uh, if they attempted intubation in the field and they ultimately placed a supraglottic airway device, then that patient was counted in the supraglottic airway device group. And this was because the idea of supraglottic devices at that time was not, as a primary airway intervention, was not very well accepted. So I would say a lot of this data should be taken with a grain of salt because oftentimes, while they didn't quantify this in the studies, um, it was used as a rescue device, which, as you might expect, could result in poor neurologic outcomes. And then it's also to note, it's important to note that in Japan, in order to be able to intubate in the field, they have to have a pretty uh, high level of experience. I, I think it was like they need 30 OR uh, intubations on real patients before they're able to intubate in the field, um, which is much more stringent criteria than we have in the United States a lot of times. 
And then I'm not going to go into all of these articles, but there's also just numerous studies highlighting the same point, and that is that first pass success really does matter when it comes to intubating in the emergency setting. So now we're gonna review some of the more recent clinical trials surrounding airway management and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So this first study, this is the PART trial, and it included 27 US EMS agencies. They reviewed 3,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, and they compared the King airway, so laryngeal tube placement with endotracheal intubation. And they chose the laryngeal tube because that is the most commonly used extragotic device in the pre-hospital setting in the United States. And their primary outcome was 72-hour survival. And what they found was that the initial placement of a laryngeal tube resulted in higher 72-hour survival than a strategy of initial endotracheal intubation placement. They also found that from the time that EMS arrived to the airway start time was almost three minutes shorter with the laryngeal tube than with intubation, supporting the hypothesis that the laryngeal tube is more efficient than intubation. The next study, this is the Airways 2 trial. This was four different ALS agencies included um, in this study serving a population of over 21 million in the UK, and they reviewed over 9,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, so a lot of data. Um, and what they tested was initial airway management using the eye gel or intubation. And the study randomized medics to either the eye gel or the intubation strategy for the entire trial, so there was no crossover to the alternate treatment arm. And what they found was that there was no difference in primary outcome of hospital survival with favorable functional outcome. But they did find that initial ventilation success was significantly better in the eye gel group um, versus the intubation group. And then this last trial from this group was the CAM study, which is the cardiac arrest airway management trial. This was about 2,000 adult patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that were randomized to either the intubation or the bag mask ventilation group. And the primary outcome was 28-day survival with favorable neurologic status. And what they found was that the bag mass ventilation group showed significantly higher 28-day favorable neurologic status when compared with intubation. It was 4.3% versus 4.2. And there were no discernible differences in survival to hospital admission or 28-day uh, survival. So in summary, the study could not demonstrate the non-inferiority of bag mass ventilation compared to endotracheal intubation. So it's not unacceptably worse than intubation. And then this last study that I wanted to review on this topic, it just came out in November of 2022. It's super relevant to our question in San Diego County where we have the King Airway. And they compared first, first pass success rate of the King and the iGel device um, during out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this was a study that was done in Canada. They had 2,900 patients included in the study with a breakdown of King versus iGel as shown. And what they found was that the first pass success rate was 77% for the King Airway and 91% for the iGel. So the iGel resulted in an overall higher percentage of first pass success rate when compared with the King um, by 2.94 times. And then they also found that there was a small but significant correlation suggesting that the number of attempts to successful insertion is lower in the iGel group than in the King Airway. And you can see the raw frequencies in this table that show that the iGel had fewer number of attempts uh, for successful intubation. So overall, this study favors the iGel in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So these studies are some of the best evidence that we have to date regarding advanced airway management and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And as I mentioned, a lot of the older data, which is out there, is biased and is poor quality. Um, there was some indication that extraglottic airway devices are faster and may show some neurologic benefit, but none of these studies indicate a clear clinical advantage for endotracheal intubation over bagging or supraglottic airway in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So given these findings and the complexity of intubation and resource investment needed for paramedics to attain and maintain proficiency, I think it's reasonable to think that we'll continue to see a shift away from intubation to primary supraglottic use and out of hospital cardiac arrest resuscitation. Something that we do know is that high quality CPR, which includes minimizing interruptions, is the primary component influencing survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest. And most of the studies that I reviewed indicate that the iGel is most in line with this goal, as in it's fast to insert, and then as a result requires fewer attempts for successful placement and interruptions to CPR. And then one last topic that comes up a lot in this debate and discussion that I think is worth touching on, but not going too far into, into detail on, because there's definitely more data that's needed and more research needed, 
But this was a study done in 2012 that suggests that extraglottic airway devices might decrease cerebral perfusion pressure. And the study looked at three different devices and their compression on carotid blood vessels in the pig models who were in cardiac arrest. Um, there have been uh, studies done since this that give us reason to believe that the situation in humans might be different than the situation in pigs due to anatomical differences. And one of these studies actually looked at radiographic evaluation of carotid artery compression for patients that had extraglottic airway devices already in place. Um, it was, there's not that many people in the study, it was like 17 patients and they were not in cardiac arrest. So potentially the low flow state of cardiac arrest would would change these results, but that data, that research study did show that there was not, um, there was uh, no compression of the uh, carotids. So just something to keep in mind. So just a quick summary, summary slide when evaluating the use of superglottics in out of hospital cardiac arrest as either primary airway interventions versus secondary rescue devices. So pros for their use as primary, which we've already covered, high first pass success, especially due to the ease of placement when CPR is ongoing in less than ideal intubating conditions. Also, paramedics are not experienced intubators. Um, and then as far as reasons for uh, superglottics being secondary devices is, as I mentioned, endotracheal intubation has long been the gold standard of airway management. It doesn't mean that can't change, but um, worth noting. And then also the importance of maintaining this skill. So if we were to take away uh, paramedics' um, ability to intubate an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, they may not be able to really maintain this skill anymore because that is a lot of the opportunity uh, that medics get to intubate. And then this whole last thing that I mentioned um, about the device potentially affecting the cerebral perfusion pressure, but more research needs to be done into that. So my recommendation, um, I think it's reasonable to allow paramedics to have one attempt at intubation and making sure that that attempt is less than 15 seconds. And if that attempt is unsuccessful, there should be no further attempts at intubation and they should move on to a superglottic device like the eye gel. So on to our next question. Is there a recommendation for EMT use of supraglottic airways? So 2019 was the first revision to the National EMS Scope of Practice model in a decade. And the scope of practice reflects the latest evidence and best practices in EMS care. And the use of supraglottics and waveform capnography at the EMT level was extensively debated. And the discussion primarily focused on the ease of the skill, the need for waveform capnography, and the need for additional education and training. And as you can see, ultimately, it was not included in the standard scope of practice. And so while SGA placement and capnography are not at the national EMT scope of practice, the majority of states have allowed this as an EMT skill, either at the state scope of practice or by agency sponsors, sponsorship and training. California is a little more complicated because we have the local, local optional scope of practice that's applied for by the LEMSAs to the MSAs to, for approval. Um, and then just a little bit about uh, bag mass ventilation. So this is very well documented in the literature that it's a really difficult skill to master. To be done effectively, it requires two people. And some of the challenges include the ability to control the rate, control the volume, maintain a good mass seal. There's also the added risk of stomach insufflation and just a general lack of airway protection. So advantages to adding supraglottic airways as an EMT skill include, um, as we've demonstrated in all of the above research, um, it has uh, really high first pass success rates and that's in novice trainers. So a lot of the uh, studies that we reviewed before were in inexperienced providers. Um, additionally, this would allow paramedics to focus on other aspects of uh, resuscitation. So if the EMTs were able to focus on the airway, the paramedic could potentially um, enhance the other aspects of, it, of resuscitation and get things moving a little bit quicker. So diving a bit more into the data on this topic. So this study compared ventilation efficacy of inexperienced airway providers with bag mass ventilation versus the King laryngeal tube, again, in a simulated environment. And they did this by primarily measuring, measuring tidal volumes and then secondarily measuring peak pressures with each technique. And these providers were able to provide higher ventilation volumes and higher peak pressures with the laryngeal tube uh, than when compared to bag mass ventilation. And this is in line with prior studies of similar nature with both King Airways and LMAs that demonstrate higher efficacy. This next study, this is a prospective multi-center observational cohort study. This was done with EMTs in Austria, and it compared the safety, which they defined as injuries and regurgitation, 
and the feasibility, which they defined as successful ventilation using the laryngeal tube and out of hospital cardiac arrest. So the laryngeal tube was taught as the primary device of choice without any bagging prior to it. Um, and then they could use bag mass ventilation as backup. So you can see there's obviously times in these graphs where bagging was looked at first, and that was only used in the, as a primary when timely laryngeal tube uh, was not available. So they looked at over 500 cases, and you can see the breakdown of laryngeal tube versus, versus bag mass ventilation. So in the top right, you can see the complication rate between the two was about the same. It was only the switch when they had to go from laryngeal tube to bag mass ventilation, where there was a significant increase in the complication rate. Um, but then in the bottom right, you can see the success graph. Um, just of note, in Austria, they don't have waveform capnography. So the way that they measured success was by EMTs and an EMS physician uh, observing chest rise. And what they found was that ventilation was deemed successful in 30% of bag mass ventilations with significantly higher ventilation success in the laryngeal tube group at 93%, and then significantly lower in the laryngeal tube to bag mass ventilation where they had to switch in the middle group. So this last study on this topic was also done in Austria. Um, EMTs were included in the study and they all completed a pre-study training on bag mass ventilation and on laryngeal tube placement. And when asked in the pre-study training simulated environment, a lot of the EMTs preferred the laryngeal tube. However, when they moved this over to the field, they really didn't find any difference in the ease of handling and efficacy, the frequency of complications and the outcomes. So these results indicate that the laryngeal tube ventilations by EMTs during out of hospital cardiac arrest is not superior to bag mass ventilation. And they assume that the main benefit of the laryngeal tube is having an alternate airway when bag mass ventilation fails. So regardless of what type of advanced airway is being utilized, the most important step is confirming placement with waveform capnography. Um, this is one study that is somewhat consistent with a lot of other studies that demonstrate that there are too many misplaced airway devices in the pre-hospital setting, both supraglottic and endotracheal intubation or and intubation tubes. Um, and this study showed a misplacement rate of around 14%. And the problem is not misplacement of the two per se, it's the lack of recognition of the misplacement. Um, so this was a big article that came out in the EMS community in 2019, after it was discovered that patients were arriving at the ED with misplaced breathing tubes. Um, this was in Rhode Island, all 11 patients identified over a two year period died. Um, and the article is really interesting. It covers a lot of the challenges um, faced in making changes within the state to prevent these occurrences. Um, but yeah, it just basically highlights the importance of confirming tube placement. Um, and then the last point, so EMT basic training. Um, the average training program in the United States is only 120 to 150 hours, um, which is not a lot of time at all. And just learning the skill of placing a supraglottic airway device is not enough. You know, they need to also have the clinical judgment, be able to troubleshoot it, know when it's appropriate, know how to troublesh um, troubleshoot any problems that may um, come up. So it's not nothing. And it's just a reminder that currently EMTs in San Diego County do not currently have any end title CO2 monitoring skills or equipment, which as we mentioned is incredibly important for the use of these devices. So pros and cons for EMT use of supraglottic airways. So pros, this will just add another school a skill or tool in the toolbox for airway management. It's easier than bag mass ventilation in many patients. And like we said before, it enables medics to work on other aspects of resuscitation. As far as cons, um, it will need to be, there will need to be more training in an already tight curriculum. And then also um, in San Diego County where we don't have significantly prolonged uh, transport times, it may not be as necessary. So my recommendation for this, I think it's reasonable to start with implementation of the IGEL for paramedics in San Diego County, and we can consider future lo local optional scope of practice for EMTs, but, you know, it must be implemented alongside waveform capnography. So going into the last topic of discussion, which is pre-hospital pediatric airway management. Thankfully, pediatric respiratory emergencies are low frequency. However, when they do occur, they're very high risk encounters. And airway management is critical, particularly in pediatric patients, because respiratory conditions are the are a frequent cause of cardiac arrest. Um, and in general, there's a significant amount of uncertainty surrounding the risk versus benefit of different airway management techniques in pediatrics. Um, 
But in 2018, as we know, California um, removed pediatric endotracheal intubation from the paramedic scope of practice. And a lot of this was based on studies that found no difference in outcome of bag mass ventilation versus endotracheal intubation when performed in an urban environment. So currently in San Diego County, we have pediatric and neonatal bag mass ventilation and capnography. We don't have any extra glottic airways in the toolbox. So it's important to recognize that pediatric airways are not just small adult airways. You can see in the image on the right here, some of the important anatomical differences, including having a proportionally long, larger tongue, a floppy epiglottis, et cetera. Um, so understanding these differences would have to be a critical goal of educational initiatives per, for paramedics. And the, it's a crucial in ensuring their ability to form appropriate primary impressions and to develop appropriate treatment plans for these patients. So I think this is a really great figure. It kind of looks at the different airway interventions in the EMS setting and their complex relationships between the invas invasiveness of the intervention, the frequency and difficulty of the intervention, and lastly, the effort needed to maintain competency when performing it and the balance of all of these. So does the literature support extraglottic airway use in pediatric patients, particularly when there are no other advanced airway options? So the NAM, NAEMSP position statement and resource document on pre-hospital pediatric respiratory distress and airway management provided a great section on supraglottic airway use in pediatrics and pointed, pointed me towards some of the best studies on this topic. So the first study was in pediatric emergency care and it compared endotracheal intubation with King airway placement in a simulated setting. There were 37 paramedics in two identical clinical scenarios. And in the study, King airways were found to provide earlier more consistent and adequate ventilation. And you can see the time difference there. The next study is a comparison of pediatric airway management techniques during out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this is using the CARES database. Um, there are 405 different uh, EMS agencies included with over 1,700 out of hospital cardiac arrests. And you can see the breakdown of 45% bag mass ventilation, 42% endotracheal intubation and 13% supraglottic airway use. And again, this data is a little, should be taken with a grain of salt because the final airway use was what was counted. Um, overall, 21% had ROSC and 11% survived to hospital discharge. Um, but what they found was that bag mass ventilation was associated with higher survival to hospital discharge compared to endotracheal intubation and supraglottic airway device. But more, um, like, uh, more studies need to be done to confirm these findings. And then the next study, this was a prospective observational study, looked at 155 pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. This was actually a subset of the PART trial, which we talked about for adults. And what they found was that the King airway and the IGEL were the most commonly used supraglottic airways in this study. And the primary study outcome was the time to the initial dose of epinephrine, where there was found to be no difference between those devices. Um, they did show first attempt success higher in the supraglottic airway device, uh, device group with the eye gel being 100% successful placement and the king having 80% successful placement. And lastly, there's thoughts that the bagging group may have higher risk of aspiration, subsequent pneumonia, but they actually found lower rates of pneumonia in the bag mass group um, compared to the supraglottic and intubation group. And then the last study was a, me a meta-analysis, so the strongest level of evidence in pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. This study was commissioned by the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation Pediatric Life Support Task Force. So they were trying to determine whether advanced airway intervention, whether that be tracheal intubation or supraglottic airway placement, improves outcomes in resuscitation from cardiac arrest in children when paired with bad bag mass ventilation or compared to each other. And what they found is that Tracheal intubation and supraglottic airways are not superior to bag mass ventilation for resuscita resuscitation of children and cardiac arrest. But unfortunately, the evidence, the certainty of the evidence included in the study was categorized as low to very low. So again, more research, randomized efficacy trials need, need to be uh, done to address this question appropriately. So in summary, when comparing supraglottics with intubation in the pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, it sounds like supraglottics are favored for multiple different reasons. However, neither supraglottics or intubation has proven superior to bag mass ventilation in pediatrics. So my recommendation is I think we can consider including training on pediatric eye gel placement if we're going to go ahead with implementing adult eye gel placement in San Diego County. 
bag mask ventilation can still be considered the first line intervention, but it's reasonable to add the eye gel to the cool toolbox since we don't have anything else. So are superglottic airways all that super? I say yes. Thank you for listening and uh, special thanks to Dr. Duncan for uh, reviewing my slides. Thank you for that outstanding lecture and review of the literature and synthesis and recommendations. Really, really excellent. We do have a number of uh, important questions and comments in the chat, so we'll just go through those. Um, Todd asked, did you mention how effective the eye gel is in preventing and managing aspiration from blood slash emesis, et cetera? You are on mute. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> um, sorry, can you repeat the question? The first question is, uh, did you mention how effective the eye gel is in preventing and managing aspiration from blood slash emesis, et cetera? So there was not a specific study. Um, aspiration was looked at in a lot of the different studies, more so on a general basis of supraglottics. Um, there was concern in some of the adult studies that bag mass ventilation did have higher rates of aspiration, but I didn't see anything specifically looking at aspiration between different supraglottic airway devices. Um, but I can, I can do another search and see if anything um, pops up specifically on that question. Thank you. And the next point is, can the presentation be shared? Great job. Uh, as with all of our presentations, they are posted on the website, and we will share that link with the group afterwards. The next uh, comment and question is from Jason. It appears that the eye gel would be more easily dislodged with patient movement due to no cuff being inflated. Is there any pre-hospital data that has looked at this? So I didn't see anything specifically looking at this. However, I did see a lot of data that um, they looked at cuff leaks and, and things more like that. And they found that the eye gel did actually provide a pretty good seal, as did some of the other uh, non-inflatable supraglottic devices. Um, I think it has to do something with the polymer and the type of uh, material used in the device that the seal is actually better than than you might expect for something that doesn't have a cuff, um, just based on the material that it's made of. All right, and Roxanne asks, if the laryngeal tube versus the BVM is significant, would they consider it for pediatrics, thereby giving a more advanced airway for pediatrics again? I think you pretty much addressed that. I'm not sure if you have anything else to add. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the studies did look at the laryngeal tube, and I think, I think, it would be reasonable to add potentially a king airway laryngeal tube, especially if medics are co more comfortable with that. But if we're already going ahead with the eye gel, that seems a little bit more uh, cutting edge and faster to insert. Um, and I think you could extrapolate that adult uh, data of its uh, ease of placement and speed of placement to the pediatric setting as well. So it may be more desirable if we're gonna go forward with implementing one of them. Okay, and Rick notes that would be a major concern, protecting the airway from aspiration. Does it look like the eye gel can accomplish this? And uh, Veer says a great, great point regarding the waveform capnometry as a mandatory part of the SGA implementation. And replying to, quote, it appears that the, end quote, uh, very important balancing measure question, placement, speed, efficiency is important, but so is rate of accidental dislodgement. Sounds like you covered that in your talk. And Dave Dun Duncan points out there are a number of anesthesia studies demonstrating good airway protection, peak pressures, and tidal volumes, even in the non-inflating devices, the air cue versus the air cue self-pressurizing device demonstrated no difference in pressure delivering capability. Although counterintuitive, these devices are effective at delivering all three, hence their extensive use in anesthesia and now in EMS. Chris Kahn uh, replies to Rick, I don't think any airway device, including endotracheal tubes, actually prevents aspiration. Emptying the stomach and having the head up a little is likely more useful than a balloon. I'll have to go review the literature again for verification. That's my recollection from the last time I looked at this. 
And Chris Sloan says lower pneumonia rates with BVM. You have any comment on that? Yeah, I found that study also a bit surprising. Uh, but the, that is what the they found was that there were lower pneumonia rates uh, when compared with superglottic and um, intubation. So it's interesting. I'm not really sure the pathophysiology behind that, but or how that happened. But that is what the, that data uh, showed. But there has been data in adult studies that have also shown the opposite. So it's definitely something that needs to be looked more into. And then going out of order, because I'm going in order, Rick replies, yes, I get that, but that's why NG tubes are used in conjunction with ETI to prevent aspiration while ventilating. So that was a response to the prior comment. Uh, and it says, uh, for your pediatrics patients who are extricated from a burning home or a vehicle that needs immediate airway intervention, do you believe that the BVM is sufficient, especially with an extended ETA to the hospital and no air transport available? Uh, that seems like a fairly concerning uh, scenario, hopefully one that isn't encountered too frequently, but um, I don't know if there's any data uh, supporting whether bagging would be sufficient. Obviously, there's risk of airway edema rapidly in those patients, but you know we don't have pediatric intubation in the field, so I don't know if there's anything suggesting that a supraglottic airway versus bagging in that specific scenario if one would be preferred, especially with the risk of worsening airway edema. I'm not sure about that one. Okay. And Joelle D'Onofrio says, for PEDS, also good to point out a lot of the older SGA studies has SGA as a rescue device, which makes their outcomes more tricky to interpret. Not evidence-based, but more FYI. Some people have been reporting dislodgement issues in less than two-year-old, especially during compressions would be an important thing to be aware of, train on, and retrospectively look at. I would support iGel in kids. Jason then jumps in and says, we need to be careful when speaking about, quote, short transport times. We have San Diego County paramedics all the way to the Imperial County line with a one hour plus transport time. Helicopters are not always available. Yes, good point about how complex our county is. And Joelle agrees. And Andy Fisher says, Kern County implemented gel a few years ago. They have transport times of one to three plus hours from the Sierra. And then there's a whole slew of compliments to you about how outstanding your talk was. And let me see if there's any other questions. I don't see any hands up or anything else in the chat. Does anyone see anything I missed? Dr. Duncan, any last words before we wrap up? No, great job, Dr. Safferman. Thank you so much for that. All right, thank you everybody for your participation. Uh, we really appreciate the excellent presentation and it gives us a, a lot to think about based on the evidence. Take care everyone, bye-bye.